Well, why don't we get uh, started? Uh, I'm Griffin Rogers. I'm the director of uh, NIDDK, and it, I'm really uh, pleased to be here and introduce uh, our speaker uh, in uh, today's Walls lecture. Uh, today's lecture really couldn't have been more timely. Uh, Dr. Bruce Spiegelman will tell us about his remarkable work in clarifying the molecular basis of obesity. Uh, Bruce wants to know how uh, energy balance is regulated in mammals, and what he's learned so far is really telling us a whole lot. For, uh, from, far from the mundane, uh, as we were initially thought, it's turning out that fat cells are really a dynamic environment, uh, uh, and it becomes a, a member of the major players in metabolism. And uh, thanks in large part to Bruce's work, the mystery that's been once shrouded uh, showing that these cells is really giving rise to a, an enormous amount of clarity uh, about the regulation. And his, his work on the genesis, the function, and the regulation of fat cells really may lead to the development of a number of, of useful uh, agents for the treatment of obesity, uh, diabetes, and insulin, uh, insulin resistance. Bruce received his uh, PhD in biochemistry from Princeton University in 1978. He did his postdoctoral training in cell biology at MIT. And since 1982, he's held a professorship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Harvard Medical School, where he is now the Stanley Karsmeyer Professor of Cell Biology uh, and Medicine. Bruce is really a, a very talented and productive investigators, and he's received numerous uh, prestigious awards for the excellence in both diabetes research, but also in cancer research as well. He and his group have made uh, tremendous progress in clarifying the regulation of fat cells, mainly at the level of gene transcription. And in 1994, he identified the master regulator of fat cell differentiation, the nuclear receptor PPR gamma. And since then, his group has uh, been probing the pathways that control PPR gamma's function, its ligands, its coactivators, and other transcription factors that affects its function. PPR gamma controls fat cell differentiation. It's also a target of an important class of anti-diabetic uh, agents, the, the TZDs, of which uh, uh, rosiglitazone and, and pioglitazone are two important members. These valuable drugs are thought to act as agonist ligands for PPR gamma, uh, working through PPR uh, response elements and target genes. In new work, uh, Bruce and his team have identified an unexpected mechanism by which PPR gamma controls whole body insulin sensitivity, and we're going to hear about that now. Uh, his title of his talk has changed so much just to reflect how quickly his work is changing. And his, the recent, his, his current title is PPR Gamma, an anti-diabetic therapy, and a new look at an old friend. So it great, gives me great pleasure to introduce Bruce Spiegelman. Thank you, Griff. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that kind introduction, Griff. And uh, I don't know if it reflects the rapid movement of the work as much as it reflects uh, my short attention span, but uh, I did uh, change the title of my talk to reflect some new work that uh, uh, we've just uh, recently completed, and we've just recently completed a first phase of this work. So it's a great pleasure to be here to see so many uh, old friends and, and make some new ones. Um, so. The context in, in, in which um, the work I'm about to describe lies is um, the medical problem of obesity and diabetes, and particularly the, the metabolic syndrome. And, and by that, what I mean is the, the cluster of, uh, of syndromes, the cluster of pathologies that go along with obesity, hypertension, insulin resistance, and dyslipidemia. And it's been known for a very long time um, that these predispose or contribute to type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But it's also important to note that uh, metabolic dysregulation and the metabolic syndrome is thought to be driving an increase in certain cancers and may account for as much as 10 to 15 percent of newly diagnosed cancers in the United States and in the United Kingdom. So, you know, this is a big 
and a growing problem and not just connected to the cardiovascular disease. And I will point out that even though we tend to think of this as an American problem, as illustrated in, in this slide, um, the, that, that people from Europe and from Africa and Asia can't snicker too much these days because in fact there's an epidemic of obesity, cardiovascular and, uh, and diabetes which is taking place uh, um, around the rest of the world as well. So our particular entry point has been for a very long time our studies of adipose cells and particularly the transcriptional regulation of adipose cells. One could take an interest in energy metabolism, the problems of obesity and diabetes by studying the liver, studying the brain, studying the pancreas, and these are all completely valid approaches. My interests going back to my postdoctoral days was in the molecular basis of cell differentiation, and we happened to, to use the fat cells as a model um, after Howard Green discovered 3T3 adipocytes. So as you probably know, there are two kinds of fat cells. White fat cells, the most common kind of fat in, in mammals, that store energy in a single big lipid droplet. They have low mitochondria, no one coupling protein one, and it is now appreciated um, that this cell type is pro-inflammatory in the context of obesity. Um, and as Griff mentioned, uh, Peter Tontinoz and my group in 90, 1994 identified PPR gamma as really a master regulator. Fat differentiation is both necessary and sufficient uh, to get differentiation in mesenchymal cells to fat. Now, brown fat cells dissipate energy uh, through having a high mitochondrial content and high expression of uncoupling protein 1. And importantly, this is a cell type that plays a natural anti-obesity role. This has been clarified in, in rodents where either the ablation of brown fat or the genetic ablation of uncoupling protein 1 leads to an increased propensity uh, for obesity and diabetes. And in fact, PPR gamma drives the differentiation of brown fat cells, although it is not sufficient for the differentiation of brown fat. And other contributors to brown fat differentiation are the PGC1 coactivators, alpha and beta, especially the mitochondrial biology. And recently, we've identified a, a large zinc finger co-regulatory protein, PRDM16, that seems to play a, a dominant role in, in determining the brown fat lineage. Now, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk uh, discussing new work relating to PPA or gamma, so I want to go into a little more detail. So in, in 94, uh, Tontinoz um, identified PPA or gamma as sort of the central transcriptional uh, control for fat cell differentiation. In 95, Steve Cleaver's group at GlaxoSmithKline um, identified um, uh, PPR gamma as the functioning receptor for the thiazolidine dione class of drugs. And in fact, um, the TZDs were known to, to induce adipogenesis, and Cleaver very cleverly put these two things together. And the role of PPR gamma as a, as a therapeutic target for the TZD drugs um, uh, is clear, is well established in every possible way. Now, the role of PPR gamma as a, uh, as a central player in insulin sensitivity um, holds true in human beings as well. There are various arguments I could use, but probably most convincing is that there is a monogenic form of lipodystrophy where no, no individuals with a, with a homozygous mutation in gamma, a null mutation with, for gamma have been found, but uh, monogenic forms, dominant negative forms of PPR gamma with reduced activity have been found, and they have a, uh, a severe insulin resistance, a form of lipodystrophy, a uh, very prominent in the limb and the buttocks, dyslipidemia, and early onset hypertension. This shows you a cross-section of a control in MRI. This is the gluteal fat. This is a mutant. These are the limbs and the, and the fat there. And O'Reilly says when they see an individual who has high and otherwise inexplicable insulin resistance and no buttocks, he immediately thinks of PPR gamma mutations. And we've asked O'Reilly, is the converse true? 
are there individuals that they can find who have a gain of function mutation in, in PPAR gamma, but so far those individuals have not been identified. So what I'm trying to tell you is that um, adipocytes and PPR gamma can be viewed at the center of the insulin resistance metabolic syndrome um, in the following sense. In obesity, factors secreted by PPA or gamma containing fat cells, the so-called adipokines, are altered. In lean fat, adiponectin goes up, it's an insulin sensitizer, TNF resistin and MCP1 are all low. But on the contrary, in the context of obesity, adiponectin is down. These insulin resistance factors, TNF, alpha, resistin, and MCP1 are high. Furthermore, fat does not absorb free fatty acids as robustly as it should. Even though the fat is expanding, you get extra adipose deposition of lipid in the liver and in the muscle and in the macrophage as well. In addition to that, we know that the TZD drugs working through PPA or gamma can cause improved insulin sensitivity in the whole organism. And this is true in rodents and is also true in human beings. Now, the model up until now, very reasonable, is a drug that binds to and functions as an agonist for PPA or gamma is working therapeutically as an agonist for PPR gamma. And what I'm going to tell you is that this is probably not true. And I want to point out before I get into the experimental data some of the paradoxes. As I mentioned, PPR gamma, even in humans, is unambiguously involved in insulin sensitivity. You can activate this factor with drugs and get anti-diabetic therapy and mutations cause severe insulin resistance. But there's a couple of things to ponder, to consider. Even though these so-called PPR gamma agonists like rosiglitazone and pioglitazone improve insulin resistance and diabetes, most PPR gamma target genes are already fully on in obesity. There is no general deficiency either in PPAR gamma or in PPR gamma target genes in obesity, insulin resistance, and diabetes. This is not like hypothyroidism that is being treated with thyroid hormone. There's no evidence really for any substantial defect in PPR gamma signaling in a general sense. And yet you can get a therapeutic effect by hitting that receptor with a drug. But probably more to the point that sets the stage for the data I'm about to show you. The classic things that are being used for to treat humans right now, pioglitazone and rosiglitazone, are full agonists for this receptor. But at least in preclinical, advanced preclinical development, some PPR gamma ligands with poor agonist activity still have marked, perhaps even just as good, anti-diabetic activity. So the way this has been explained up in this point is for people to wave their hands and to say partial agonism. Partial agonism really in this case means we have no idea. So I'm going to now show you data that goes from the molecular and even the atomic to some human data. So I want to give you the model of what I'm about to tell you. And this new work is just in press in nature. It'll be, I don't know when it's coming out, but it was just accepted. But I'm going to tell you the model of what I'm going to tell you. High fat diets leading to obesity cause the activation in adipose cells and adipose tissue of a protein kinase called CDK5. CDK5 causes a phosphorylation of PPAR gamma at a single phosphate serine 273. This phosphate neither activates the receptor in a general sense, nor does it repress the receptor in a general sense. Rather, it causes a dysregulation of a specific subset of genes, such as adiponectin, adipsin, and CD36, all genes known to be dysregulated in obesity. Furthermore, what I'm going to tell you is that the anti-diabetic PPAR gamma ligands block this phosphorylation. 
And ordinarily, the interpretation might be that it worked as an agonist and it turned on a phosphatase. But what I'm going to tell you is that this works outside the context of agonism and even works in a test tube, that all of the anti-diabetic PPR gamma ligands cause a conformational change in PPR gamma that blocks the ability of CDK5 to phosphorylate it thereby normalizing the gene expression in adipose tissue, including things like CD36, adiponectin, and adipsin. And I'll show you data in cells, in animals, and in human beings. Okay. So we showed that CDK5 is phosphorylated by PPAR gamma. Now, why did we do that experiment? The way, reason we did that experiment is that Jang Choi, the postdoc doing this work, was working on the project looking for the natural ligand of PPAR gamma. This is the project that when I assign it to somebody, they immediately look for side projects. Because to this day, nobody knows what the real functioning natural ligand is. So I think of it as a trick to stimulate creativity in my fellows. I assign them to the PPAR gamma ligand project. So for reasons, there were some reasons. Uh, he did some sequence staring at PPR gamma, and as you'll hear, CDK5 is known to be downstream of inflammatory pathways, which occurs in, in obesity, diabetes. But this beginning of this project didn't excite me a great deal. Jang uh, found that there was a, a conserved serine 273 in PPR gamma 2, according to the gamma 2 nomenclature, it's in gamma 1. It's not in PPAR alpha, it's not in PPR delta, this subfamily of nuclear receptors. And the serine 273 is conserved in literally all sequenced PPAR gammas. Okay? When Jang, uh, in a test tube, combine CDK5 with its activating subunit P35, he could phosphorylate at um, serine 273, he gets the phosphate band, and by mutating serine 273, this one serine, you don't see the phosphorylation, okay? Now, an important point to make, and I'll come to this in a second, is that the only other CDK5s don't do this. So I'm going to go into more detail in a second, but CDK5, forget everything you know about the cyclin-dependent kinases. CDK5 is a member of the family that is not activated by cyclins and has no known role in the cell cycle. Okay? But CDK1, CDK2, CDK4, with their activating cyclins, do not phosphorylate PPA or gamma. And this is also true in cells. He could co-transfect PPA or gamma with an active, with an active allele, wild-type uh, CDK5. He gets a phosphoband. Kinase dead doesn't do this. And in cells, when he transfects the serine 273 allele, it is not phosphorylated. So on the face of it, it looks like a single kinase hitting a single phosphate. Okay, well, one imagines there must be lots of kinases that that hit CDK, that hit PPR gamma. So if you hold on a second, I'll tell you why, why we care. First of all, what's CDK5? So cyclin-dependent kinase 5 is a member of the cyclin-dependent kinase family, but it is not activated by cyclins. It has an analog to the cyclins, a protein called P35, which has a hyperactive form of this activating subunit called P25. This is best studied in the brain because CDK5 is famous as tau kinase. It's thought to be involved in the hyperphosphorylation of tau. So if you PubMed CDK5, the vast majority of papers you're going to see will be related to the nervous system and neurodegeneration. This is thought to be an important player. CDK5 is activated by oxidative stress and by cytokines. Um, and it's thought that that major function there is that those pathways lead to the cleavage of P35 to P25. P25 is more active and more stable, so it's oftentimes the P25-CDK5 partnership. So you could think of P25 as the equivalent to the cyclin for this member of the CDK5 family, although it has nothing to do with the cell cycle. Okay. So all the work the rest of the way, we, we have a specific antibody that we made against the phosphorylated form of PPR gamma, phosphate 273, and we have a phospho-specific antibody. So that's the tool I'm going to be using now. So basically, if you take fat cells 
and you treat them with TNF-alpha or IL-6, so these pro-inflammatory cytokines, mainly from the neurobiology literature, are known to activate CDK5. Lo and behold, we get phosphorylation of PPA or gamma under those treatments. So many of you will know that pro-inflammatory signal is up in the context of fat cells and obesity, but the free fatty acids and lipids are also high. So this wasn't in the literature. Jang showed that high levels of FFAs treated adipocytes also activates this phosphorylation of PPA or gamma. Are, the, is there, are there a host of kinases doing this? Well, same conditions, FFAs, TNF-alpha, IL-6, when Jang suppresses CDK5 signaling with an SHRNA against CDK5, we block nearly all of this signaling. So at least in fat cells, the kinase that hits this site, a downstream of, of cytokines and free fatty acids, appears to be in majority to be CDK5. <clears throat> okay. So what does this do? Why should we care? Well, first of all, this phosphorylation has no effect that we can detect on adipogenesis. So we take PPA or gamma minus cells that Evan Rosen made when he was a fellow in my group in 2000 or so, 1999-2000, and we add back either the wild-type allele or the non-phosphorylatable allele of PPA or gamma, serine 273 to alanine. First of all, in transcription assays, minus or plus rosy glitazone through a PPAR reporter gene, you see no difference. So there's no gross change in transcriptional activity between the wild type and the mutant allele. And furthermore, you can see in these dishes stained where the lipid is stained with oil red O, there's no change in overall adipogenesis. So at this point, we see no gross change in the properties. And so it was a bit of a surprise when Jang at first took some sample genes, and later, of course, we did complete transcriptional profiling, and he found that some subset of genes, and a very interesting subset of genes, care a great deal about this phosphorylation. Now, remember, we're looking at the effect of the mutant, so the wild type will be phosphorylated, and the mutant is not phosphorylated. And what we find is that in the mutant, cells expressing mutant PPR gamma, there's elevation of CD36, adiponectin, adipsin, a slight rise in resistant, and a rise in leptin. And furthermore, you can see more adiponectin secreted into the medium in the mutant cells, suggesting that this phosphorylation was restraining the expression of the RNA level of adiponectin and restraining the secretion of the protein. So this is, this frankly is when I took an interest in the project because I've been around the block in adipogenesis long enough to know that that's famous as a set of genes dysregulated in obesity and diabetes. Adiponectin and adipsin were the first fat cell genes really shown to be markedly dysregulated commonly in models of obesity. Um, so this really uh, began to pique our interest that could this be involved in the pathogenesis of obesity, diabetes, this phosphorylation of PPR gamma. So, of course, the culture conditions we used, you know, one always worries about whether they're correct. So we also did an experiment in vivo, a transplantation experiment. We took fibroblasts, gamma minus fibroblasts, we put in the wild type, PPR gamma or the mutant non-phosphorylatable PPR gamma didn't differentiate them, but simply injected them under the skin of mice, waited six weeks, you get a lump of fat form. This is Howard Green first showed this in the 70s. And then we isolated that lump of fat and we did gene expression analysis. And basically the two most prominent genes that are dysregulated are again adiponectin and adipsin. CD36 has a trend. Uh, to be increased in the mutant, not quite significant, um, and an increase in leptin, which in some experiments is significant, some experiments is not. Okay, so this phosphorylation in some at this point doesn't cause a gross change in the properties of PPA or gamma, but causes the dysregulation of a few genes that are known to be dysregulated in, in obesity, diabetes, and furthermore, the phosphorylation itself in culture is can be caused experimentally by cytokines or by free fatty acids 
both of which are certainly elevated in the context of most obese mice and most obese humans. So the question is, what is going on with CDK5 and with the phosphorylation of PPR gamma in bona fide obese animals? And that is shown here. So first of all, we can measure the activation of CDK5 with an antibody against the tyrosine phosphorylation that also happens when CDK5 is phosphorylated. So this is standard diet, this is high fat diet. So if mice are put on a high fat diet for three weeks, and well, let's first look at the CDK5 panel, you see no change. And in three weeks on a high fat diet, in our hands, the diet we're using, we see, don't see any hyperinsulinemia indicative of insulin resistance. At about seven weeks, we start to see a trend toward elevated insulin. And here you can see <clears throat> a phosphorylation that's equivalent to activation of CDK5. And furthermore, I call your attention down here. P35 is very unstable. The activating subunit, P35, gets cleaved to the more stable P25. S not three, but seven weeks on a high-fat diet, you start to see the emergence of cleave P25, just like you do in the brain in neurodegeneration, you begin to see activation. And of course, this is even more obvious, both of these are even more obvious at 13 weeks on a high fat diet, when the animals are frankly obese and frankly insulin resistant, okay? So when PPR gamma really mirrors this, at three weeks you don't see any difference, at seven weeks you begin to see hyperphosphorylation of PPR gamma at the site, standard diet versus high fat diet, and at 13 weeks the delta between the standard diet and the high fat diet is extremely clear. Okay, is this true for all fat depots? And the answer is yes. So as you know, visceral fat exemplified by the epididymal fat is thought to be kind of the bad fat to correlate better with metabolic disease as opposed to subcutaneous fat, an example of which is inguinal fat. So this shows you side by side the same animals, standard diet, high fat diet in the epididymal fat, the visceral fat, standard diet, high fat diet in the inguinal fat, a version of sub-Q fat. And it's clear that although you have an increase in the phosphorylation even in the subcutaneous fat, the inguinal fat, the actual absolute level of phosphorylation is much higher in visceral fat than it is in the subcutaneous fat. Okay. So this led us now to ask a more ambitious question. Does being a CDK5 target gene really mean that you are going to be dysregulated in obesity. So using transcriptional profiling of cells expressing the mutant and the wild type, um, we created a gene set of CDK5 sensitive genes and then filtered that through the transplant experiments to show, looked at what held up in an in vivo context as well. And then using a, a, a computational method called principal component analysis, we created a set of about 15 or 16 of the genes that were most sensitive to CDK5. So with all the things going on in obesity and diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, high lipid levels, high cytokine levels, when we create a, the best gene set of CDK5 sensitive genes in cultured adipocytes, never touching an obese animal to do this, can we predict just on that basis who's going to be dysregulated in obesity? And to an incredible extent, the answer is yes. So these are our, these are our most sensitive genes, CDK5 sensitive genes, and I think it was 16 out of 19 of the genes that we predicted as CDK5 target genes are dysregulated in obesity diabetes. Some of them are famous genes like adiponectin, uh, and, uh, and this is adipsin. But some of these, there's no literature on them. This is side C. Um, this is a nuclear receptor. I don't even remember which one it is. This is CD24A. So basically it predicts, uh, this is carbonic anhydrase. Being a, a bona fide CDK5 target gene in a fat cell means there's a very high probability that you're going to be dysregulated in a, an obese, insulin-resistant animal. Okay. So, 
Let me now move on to another part of the story. So that was interesting and a little bit strange and exciting. But the, the next part of the story took us in, an, in, an, in a really completely unexpected direction. Namely, what about the PPA or gamma ligands? So obviously, this is a phosphorylation in PPA or gamma. We thought maybe there would be some kind of homeostatic system. What happens to the insulin set when you treat cells with the insulin sensitizing PPR gamma ligands, and that's shown here. So first of all, wild type PPR gamma, this is in fat cells. Um, we treat with rosy glitazone, you see nothing. You treat with TNF alpha, you see phosphorylation. Okay, well this is kosher, this is what I just showed you. Then we titrate in rosy glitazone, and you can see that rosy glitazone suppresses this phosphorylation. This is an antagonist to PPR gamma. It does not, it binds to, but does not inhibit this phosphorylation. Then we did identical experiments with an allele of PPAR gamma um, that we discovered in a colon cancer patient back in the late 90s that binds no ligands. It's a point mutation, but it puts a, puts a proline in helix-3 and therefore can't bind any known synthetic or natural ligands. And in this case, what you see is that TNF causes the phosphorylation and none of these ligands work. So the binding of the ligand to the receptor is necessary. Now the standard interpretation, and by far what I viewed as the most likely interpretation of this data, was that it was some kind of typical endocrine feedback homeostatic system. That by activating PPR gamma, you would turn on some protein, maybe a phosphatase, maybe something else, that would feed back and modulate the phosphorylation. And I don't think I even suggested this experiment to Jang, but I think he did it anyway. He tried it in a test tube. So what he did was he took PPAR gamma with CDK5, put it in a test tube, gets the phosphorylation, and then he added rosy glitazone in a test tube, and rosy glitazone blocked this phosphorylation or decreased this phosphorylation in the test tube, even with purified CDK5. Now, one important control was to throw another substrate into the reaction, so you could put in RB protein, PRB, Rosy glitazone has no effect on the ability of CDK5 to phosphorylate PRB. So it can't be that rosy glitazone is unbeknownst to us off target and hitting CDK5 directly. The only reasonable interpretation of this data is that rosy glitazone is binding to PPR gamma and making it a less good substrate for CDK5. So, if you've been in the field a long time, not spoken about in polite company, is the fact that even though everybody thinks rosy glitazone and pioglitazone are agonist ligands, people are developing ligands that have rather lousy agonist activity but still have pretty good anti-diabetic effect. A couple of compounds are now in clinical development that don't look like good ligands. So in the literature, this is the start of a, an important collaboration with Pat Griffin's lab, the head of chemical biology at the Scripps campus in Florida, and Pat's team have played around with some of these ligands. So Pat suggested the use of MRL24, and we both liked it because it's reported to have bad agonist activity. It does not stimulate adipogenesis. And I can tell you, if, if a compound is any kind of agonist at all for PPR gamma, it's going to induce adipogenesis. MRL24 does not induce adipogenesis. So this shows you a repeat, basically a repeat of what's published in Zhang's hand, a transcriptional reporter gene assay, PPA or gamma, the effect of rosy glitazone and dose response on transcription and MRL24, which is, as published, a pretty crappy agonist ligand. Does that inhibit the phosphorylation? It not only inhibits the phosphorylation in cells, it does it better than rosy glitazone. So for example, this is the level of phosphorylation we see on PPR gamma with 300 nanomolar of rosy glitazone. This is 30 nanomolar of MRL24. So we are seeing a very substantial block of phosphorylation of gamma in this range. This is the level of agonism that we are talking about. We, we have a different biochemical effect that's very potent at a level where the agonism is minimal. 
Furthermore, take it in vitro, mix them in a test tube. This is the effect of MRL24 on the phosphorylation of PPR gamma in the presence of excess CDK5 in a test tube. And once again, it has no effect on the phosphorylation of PRB. So this is the data that says unambiguously rosiglitazone and MRL24 differ widely in their transcriptional agonism, but they share a property, they share two properties. They are both anti-diabetic and they both have the ability to block CDK5 phosphorylation of PPAR gamma. They're both ligands, they both work through PPAR gamma, but they differ in their agonism and they share anti-diabetic activity. So then Pat went ahead and made all of the best known ligands for PPR gamma that were so-called partial agonists that were known, proven to have anti-diabetic activity in either rodents or humans, uh, shown here. Uh, as advertised, they have crappy agonist activity. This up here is rosy glitazone. And then in this pile here is MRL24, something called NTZDPA. This is a metabolics compound, MBX102. This is some biovitrum uh, compound. All of these have anti-diabetic activity in experimental models. Every single one of them blocks the phosphorylation of PPAR gamma by CDK5. Okay. So stepping back for a minute from our favorite genes and some of the famous genes dysregulated in obesity, we're using affymetrix analysis and, uh, and uh, self-organizing clustering, um, we can study these things. Uh, you know, blue means cold, means that levels are going down. Red means things are turned on. So first of all, when we compare wild type cells versus cells with this mutant non-phosphorylatable um, uh, uh, PPAR uh, gamma. There are genes that are turned down, this group which is very robustly turned on, and then a bigger group of genes. These are some of the famous genes in this group of obesity, diabetes, like a dipsin and a diponectin are in this group. But what's really interesting is when we compare two ligands that have anti-diabetic activity, rosy glitazone, full agonist, MRL24, a bad agonist. There, I'll show you data even in our own hands. They're both essentially equally effective anti-diabetics, but you see very different gene expression profiles. And what's really clear is they do not share this huge group of activated genes, and I can tell you these are the adipogenic genes. These are the classic targets of, of PPAR gamma, the classic genes of fat cell differentiation. MRL24 does not turn them on. What they do share is this set of genes down here. And you might ask what they are if you didn't have this data. But what we know, this group of genes that are both activated by MRL24 and ROSI are genes that are also activated when you compare the mutant in the CDK5 site to wild type cells. So what I'm saying is that a significant portion of the genes shared by the action in fat cells of rhodizeglitazone and MRL24 are also genes that are subject to control by the CDK5 phosphorylation of PPA or gamma. What is going on structurally? Again, in collaboration with Pat Griffin, I'm not showing you the raw data because I'll assume there are not so many structural biologists here. PPA gamma has been crystallized with both rosy glitazone and with MRL24. And Pat and his group do a technique called hydrogen deuterium exchange, which basically looks at the flexibility of different parts of the, of the molecule. Again, I'm going to skip you all the raw data and just take that. I'm just going to posit that for a second. Blue means a part of the molecule decreases in flexibility. Um, with the binding of the ligand. So on the left is rosy glitazone. And what you see prominently is the locking in place of, this is helix 12, this is the classical agonist helix. This is serine 273 over here. But even rosy glitazone, in addition to the activating helix 12, is causing a locking in place, a loss of flexibility in part of helix 3, and part of a beta sheet region, which forms basically a face with serine 273. MRL24 does this 
even more obviously, there is no effect on the Helix 12 at all. But the Helix 3, the beta sheet, and the hinge region called H2H2 prime that includes the serine 273 are very much locked into place. So if I could, uh, if I could show this in, in, in graphic form, basically what this data is saying is that the binding of rosy glitazone and especially the binding of MRL24, you have part of the molecule with serine 273 ordinarily being flexible and available to solvent. And upon binding of those ligands, it's lock slowing it down and locking it into place, presumably in a form that is not compatible with the action of CDK5. It may just be making that serine un unavailable. So from a mechanistic perspective, what's going on? Well, we, we don't know the answer to that, but one obvious straightforward question we can ask is, does this phosphorylation affect occupancy uh, on chromatin, whether the Pepler gamma is phosphorylated or not. So what we can do is take a gene that's not sensitive to this phosphorylation like AP2 and one that is very sensitive to the phosphorylation like odiponectin and we can either treat the cells with TNF-alpha which will activate the phosphorylation or not. So this is TNF treated or not. So this is phosphorylated or not. And you can see that for both genes there is no change in the chromatin occupancy stimulated by the phosphorylation. And this would tend to argue that this is not controlling chromatin occupancy, and therefore it is likely, though not proven, that it's controlling interaction between PPA or gamma and some other transcription factor or some other co-regulatory protein that is modulated by that phosphate. And what that other, what that other protein is, we don't know at this point. So let me now head towards some in vivo data. And the question is, in cultured cells, we can establish causality between specific events of gene dysregulation and treatments with those ligands. In vivo, at this point, we cannot establish causality, but we can ask very much about the quality of the correlation. So what we did is we treated obese mice, fed a high-fat diet with MRL24 or rosy glitazone. This is a glucose tolerance test, and as reported, we're simply repeating other people's work. There's a very nice effect improvement of glucose tolerance uh, compared to saline-injected uh, animals. And serum insulin also decreases, so it's clear the action is an insulin sensitizer. There is no change in um, the body weight, but the important point here is that each and every mouse treated with these drugs at therapeutic doses is decreasing their phosphorylation as a consequence of the therapeutic uh, drugs, MRL24 or rosiglitazone. And I'm not going to show you the data because I've shown you enough gene data, but basically there's also a reversal of the CDK5 gene set and reversal of a lot of the obesity gene set. So we've also done a small clinical trial in human beings. And let me set up the, the clinical trial. Basically, um, in Germany at the University of Leipzig Medical Center with Matthias Bluer as the PI, uh, newly diagnosed male uh, diabetics, uh, mostly middle age, um, were started on four milligrams per day of rosy glitazone, a sort of starter dose of rosy glitazone. Uh, they were treated for six months. Um, they were biopsied before the start, and they had hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps before the start of the therapy. Then after six months on rosiglitazone, they had a biopsy, and they had a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp done. So, and this was all blinded. So in my lab, what we did was Jang uh, performed Western blot analysis and determined the fraction of phosphorylated PPAR gamma to total PPAR gamma. And what you see is before and after. First of all, you see a lot of scatter in the data. Second of all, you see some people had a, actually one individual had no decrease in phosphorylation. Some were kind of neutral. This person increased. And several of them decreased. If you average it, it is statistically significant that there's a decrease in the PPR gamma phosphorylation after six months of rosy glitazone treatment. The data looks terribly scattered, but I, I was absolutely shocked when it was combined with the clamp data. 
So the truth is a starter dose of four milligrams per day of rosiglitazone, not everybody responds to that level of drug with improvement of glucose homeostasis. So here you have a delta-delta curve. Change in the glucose infusion rate, which is a measure of the change in insulin sensitivity, and change in the phosphorylation. So these people have a higher degree of phosphorylation. These people have a better response to the clamp. And basically, there's an unbelievable correlation between the change in phosphorylation and people's clinical response. With eight patients, there's an R value of 0.93 and a P value of 0.001. And I tell you, if somebody in my lab had shown me this curve with human data, I would want to have it checked. But what I would tell you is it was blinded when we did these studies. And so what this means is that, for example, those people who who did not improve their glucose homeostasis were those people who did not change their phosphorylation. Of course, we can't establish causality in human being, but what we can say is, believe it or not, there is a higher correlation between their level of phosphorylation than there is between their fasting insulin levels and their fasting glucose levels. So the ability of rosiglitazone to modulate the phosphorylation is as tightly correlated with the improvement of, of, of of glucose homeostasis at clamp as any other variable and better than most. So that's where the human data is. Now to establish causality, as you might appreciate, one way to do this is to simply mutate this phosphorylation site in PPR gamma. In mice, Alex Banks, a postdoc in our group, is doing this. This shows you his beautiful chimera, and I'm happy to report that two days ago this guy uh, did his job, and uh, there is now germline transmission. So we have a point mutation in this site in, in uh, PPA or gamma. And so over the next six months or so, it'll probably take before we can breed them out and take out the neocassette and, and make study groups big enough. So we, you know, we, you know, we're not completely naive. We know we have a new mechanism. We know we've established a very close correlation between this phosphorylation of gamma and, and the therapeutic effects of the drugs, but we can't establish causality without an in vivo genetic model, and, and that's going on right now. So the last thing, just to be provocative, if this wasn't provocative enough, but just to be provocative, I want to talk a little bit about obesity per se. As you know, uh, the world has gone through many generations of treatment for obesity. There was the treatment of dinitrophenol to uncouple our mitochondria. I thought this one was particularly interesting. Uh, people really did intentionally swallow uh, tapeworms. It works. <laughs> the side effects may not be very pleasant, but uh, it's not likely to be approved. But even um, drugs that, are, that have been marketed for obesity are, are either not very effective not as safe as we would like them to be, or both. And even in the presence of Griff, I think I can say that there are no particularly effective medical therapies for, for obesity, and that, there is a, and that there's a great need uh, for this right now. Not to replace diet and exercise, of course, but to serve um, a, a, as an adjunct to that. So something, unless people are in the field, they might not know this. There's some really interesting observations that treatment with PPR gamma ligands cause a browning of the white adipose tissue. Now, the reason you may not have heard that is because nobody gives a damn because people actually on those drugs gain weight in adipose mass and they have fluid retention problems. So there's no way, even if histologically it looked interesting that PPR gamma ligands could brown white adipose tissue. There are too many other bad things going on for this to ever be remotely plausible as an approach to obesity. But in light of this data, we've now gone back and used some of these ligands that are very good at blocking CDK5 and, uh, and don't have agonist properties and asked about their ability to stimulate brown fat gene expression in white fat depots. So this is data from the subcutaneous uh, white fat of treated mice. This is five days, seven days of treatment. And as published, rosiglitazone causes the induction of UCP1. As I said, this is a, a cool result that nobody gave a damn about, because while this is happening, the animals are getting fatter and they're, and they're retaining, getting greater uh, plasma volumes. 
MRL24, which blocks this phosphorylation as well or even better and lacks classical agonism, induces UCP1 in vivo as well, if not better than uh, rosiglitazone. PGC1-alpha also induced by MRL24. And this is whole body energy expenditure. We can see a substantially significant increase in whole body energy expenditure with the treatment with one of these non-agonist ligands that blocks the CDK5 phosphorylation of PPA or gamma. Again, this is correlative data, but I'm very excited, very enthusiastic about this. I've shared some of this data with some of my colleagues like Phil Smith and Carol Haft at NIDDK because what this says is that we can really separate these functions. So if we think about these things from a therapeutic perspective, of course, in the end, we'd like to have orally active medications. So these chance observations that have been made by P that peeper gamma ligands can brown white adipose tissue, if we can separate out many of the, the negative effects of these, perhaps by dissecting out agonism, because I don't think these beneficial effects are agonistic, these are, this is not at these doses, this is not an agonist, and it can still bring about these good changes. So let me, let me uh, uh, come to my conclusions here now. Uh, so CDK5 is activated in obesity, in all the fat depots, and modifies PPR gamma at serine 273, this one site. This phosphorylation is sufficient to cause dysregulation of several fat cell genes, especially some of the ones that are famously known to be dysregulated in obesity, diabetes, like adiponectin. Anti-diabetic compounds, anti each and every one that we tested, anti-diabetic PPR gamma ligands block the CDK5 mediated phosphorylation, and this activity is completely biochemically separable with agonism, at least classical agonism. In the end, it does play out in changes in gene expression, but this is not like thyroid hormone working through the thyroid receptor as an agonist. It's really, these drugs, I think, are really acting as kinase inhibitors while they're working on the substrate to block the action of the kinase. And these data suggest that the anti-diabetic ligands work, at least in part, by inhibiting CDK5-mediated phosphorylation, the poisoning of PPR gamma. And I'll, and I'll go out on a limb and I'll say, at least I believe, it should be possible to develop a new class of anti-diabetic compounds specifically targeting this modification of PPAR gamma. And the good news here is that I think these compounds probably already exist. So one, you might ask, why weren't things like MRL24 pushed harder into the clinic? Well, it's not quite died, but it's come close. These compounds have come close to dying. And the answer is, the PPARs were known to have side effects. The PPAR agonists like Pio and Rosie have benefit, but they have side effects. And so when people developed these compounds that, at least in preclinical models, had benefit, it wasn't clear what they were doing. So there was really nothing to optimize. What are the molecular targets? How would you go about doing structure-activity relationships? I'm not saying this is the be-all and end-all, but this is something that can easily be measured, something that can easily be optimized. So I would maintain that there is chemical matter right now that is sitting in the freezers of the big pharmaceutical companies and maybe some of the biotechs that can be reanalyzed and Pat and I, at an academic level, are devoted to the idea of trying to develop compounds where we dial agonism out completely and see what kind of anti-diabetic effects uh, we have with those drugs. And I think this explains, at least can provide, a very economical explanation of the quandary, some of the mysteries in, in these anti-diabetic therapies. And we'll see how that plays out. Okay, so my last slide is, is my acknowledgement slide. Um, this all initiated from, this is all one body of work. I basically presented to you one paper that's now in press. And this is the initial work of Jang Hyun Choi, a postdoc from Korea in my lab, who discovered the phosphorylation of PPR gamma by CDK5. And of course, Jang is a biochemist and he was helped tremendously um, in, in physiology of the animals um, by Alex Banks, Jenna Stoll, and Shingo Kajimura, three other postdocs in my lab, with technical help from Dina Lasnik. 
very important collaborator. This project would not have been possible without Pat Griffin and his group, Michael Chalmers and Ted Kamenecka, and they've been phenomenal. Um, and they, besides the chemical biology, they also did the hydrogen deuterium exchange structural work that I showed you. And lastly, the human clinical trial was done by Matthias Bluer um, at the University of Leipzig. Matthias had postdoc with Ron Kahn, so I knew him from that, uh, from, from, from his postdoctoral work, and he's now a clinical investigator at the University of Leipzig and kindly provided us with those biopsy samples as well as the clinical data on glucose homeostasis. And lastly, I proudly mention that I'm almost a pure NIDDK investigator. Um, all the work that I've described, as well as almost everything else done by my lab, is funded by the NIH, usually by NIDDK. So thank you very much for your attention and the honor of <laughs> giving this lecture. And if you have any questions, I would, I would be more than happy to try to answer them. Hey, Frank. Yeah, you mentioned side effects, and one of the side effects for these thiazidine glions is weight gain. Do yeah. you expect that these poor agonists with high phosphorylation inhibitor activity would lessen that particular side effect? Yes, I, I, I do, and I have to tell you a little funny story about that. So with MRL24, you not only don't gain weight, the animals, this is all in mice, actually lose a little bit of weight. That's not good when you're doing metabolic research because you assume that uh, weight loss is a toxic side effect. But actually, surprisingly, we found the mice were eating just as much, and then we found this thermogenic effect in brown adipose tissue. So I don't know the mix of things, but I can tell you not only under therapeutic doses, when you dial out agonism, not only do you not gain weight, they actually have a slight propensity to lose weight. And it's not food intake. Yeah, excuse me, one, one more quick question. I didn't understand your, in the human clinical trial, the P-phosphorylated over unphosphorylated, yeah. those numbers. What percentage of, of, of uh, gamma is phosphorylated in a high-fat fed mouse of total protein? I'm embarrassed to tell you that I don't know because those are done with different antibodies, so I don't, we've not really normalized that. I don't know that. So it's some sort of absolute ratio that we use, but in terms of actual percentage, you know, I can't tell you. I mean, to get those effects on gene expression, you would think it would have to be some substantial amount, but I don't, I can't put a number on it. Yes? Hi, um, Mary Hi. Laughlin, DK. Hi. Um, so your human experiments really um, piqued my curiosity for more phenotyping, and I was wondering if either in those experiments or in the mouse experiments, given the MRL24, you measured the cytokines that could conceivably account for this increase in insulin sensitivity. Yeah, uh, well, I don't think we have a good answer to that yet. That's a, that's a, very, good, that's a very good question, but because of the issue of weight loss, we cut these experiments fairly short. <clears throat> You'd want to use these therapeutically for a week, for a month, to really do that, that experiment justice. And even though we know, as I just answered to Frank, even though we suspect the weight loss is not toxicity, but, but biologically meaningful, nevertheless, for these studies, for the point we wanted to make, weight loss would confound the studies. We wanted to look at the effect of these drugs reducing the phosphorylation directly, not reducing the phosphorylation because they do weight loss. So I have to say that we, we've really not carried that out. We probably need to carry it out a little bit longer. I don't think over a few days you get the changes in cytokines. So can you speculate on what would end up as insulin sensitivity or in changing your insulin sensitivity when you're um, tickling the adipocyte? I'm, in what in what sense can you? Well, I guess I'm. You measured cha large changes in whole body insulin sensitivity, which seems to me would have to involve the skeletal muscle. So I'm. Oh, it does how. for sure. No, no. So I mean, I guess I don't have any special insight into this. I mean, adiponectin goes up over time. The cytokines will go down. So. I, I have no doubt that those are both players. As you probably know in the field, there's the theory of excess fat spillover. 
adipokines, cytokines, but at this point, it's, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the mix of those things are under, under these non-agonist ligands. Then again, people can't agree what the mix of those things are with agonist ligands and their relative importance. Phil. So you're the only guy I know who can change his title at 30,000 feet uh, <laughs> and have something new to say before he starts and gets it. It's amazing. Uh, I, I may be asking the same question because the, the issue would be what the, the, the triggering event is. And you've mentioned adiponectin. Mm -hmm. uh, but in adiponectin, overexpressing mice, they get extremely obese. They get mm -hmm. huge. So does that sort of weigh against, in other words, in looking at what is the business end of this block in phosphorylation? I, the, I, I would not make the case, it would be foolish to make the case that just regulating adiponectin is doing this. It's part of a package of genes. When I said we made this purified set by principal component analysis of 15 most sensitive genes, that's really for computational purposes. The number of genes regulated by CDK5 phosphorylation is much higher. It's just we wanted a purified, mathematically purified set. Um, you know, again, I, 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 there's no question that adipose tissue is one of the centers of the metabolic syndrome. And the fact that you can activate PPR gamma that's expressed mainly in fat and basically is not present in skeletal muscle or present at very low levels suggests that what's going on in the fat can be one of the things that's determining the metabolic syndrome. And your own work in lipodystrophy certainly is, is consistent with that as, as well. So um, I guess I really do think of it as a combination of all of the above. I don't want to punt on this, but certainly adiponectin can affect the beta oxidation of lipids in various tissues and muscle and liver. Um, and I guess I should point out that I didn't say this in my talk, and I should have. An animal with a knockout for adiponectin is less sensitive to thiazolidine dions. That's pretty well established that this is a, the, the adiponectin is a, is a significant part but not all of the response to the TZD drugs. So it's a, it's a mixture of all of the above, and, and, and I don't think this work um, answers that question, you know, really at all as to what plays out from fat. I mean, yes, you, these things are in play, these things are being altered uh, by CDK5, but what the mix is, and you know, the key factor could be one of these new CDK5 genes about which there's no literature. So I, I, I don't assume adiponectin is the answer. I do believe the literature is saying it's part of the answer. Well, you picked a very good institute, so you'll find a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Hall in IDDK is a fascinating talk. I was just wondering if you could care to speculate on the physiological role of CDK5 yeah. induced phosphorylation. I noticed in your model slide you were saying that elevated free fatty acids are inducing this cascade, but what function does that play? Yeah. Presumably it hasn't evolved to cause insulin resistance. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great question, and uh, I, I don't have a good answer, but I guess I am struck by work by Eric Ravison, did some studies in the Pimas, I think in the 90s, which he said, okay, we know that a lot of type 2 diabetics are obese, but what is the effect of diabetes on obesity? Not the effect of obesity on diabetes. If you take equally obese people, and some, and they have different insulin sensitivities, and then you follow them longitudinally, what is the effect? It turns out that insulin resistance and diabetes restrains further weight gain when you look longitudinally. Not that people who are diabetic can't get even fatter, but if you do, if you make matched cohorts, being diabetic is bad for you, of course, but it does restrain weight gain. Well, insulin is the major anabolic hormone, so it does make a certain amount of sense. So I guess the best I can do, and I'm not sure I believe it myself, but the best I can do is to say that this may be a way of restraining the storage of, of lipid in the adipose tissue, that you may have a big bell-shaped curve that from an evolutionary perspective we all need to store, be able to store fat. We all need to be able to store a lot of fat, but at some point it may be negative for the survival of the individual, either because of cardiovascular events or 
you get eaten by something else, or you're a, you're you know you're worse at hunting, gathering, uh, you know whatever the process was during you know the billion years of evolution leading up to human beings. Just maybe that, a, maybe an alternative interpretation, since it was high free fatty acids. The other case where you get high free fatty acids is during fasting. And the last time you would actually want to be storing more fat and is during fasting. So it's just that's a, interesting. It's just that's interesting. Idea. You know, that's interesting. I've not thought about that. If we strongly fasted an animal, we, so in other words, your hypothesis would be is obesity mimicking what you would see physiologically during fasting? That's a clever idea. I've not thought about that. Thank you. Well, maybe we'll go back and try that experiment. Uh, I may have missed something, but um, it seemed that in your gene expression profiles, um, knocking out uh, phosphorylate 273 versus adding MRL 24, um, it seemed to be, the effects seem to be much more strong when you added the drug as opposed to just it knocking is. out the phosphorylation. So the question is, A, are there off-target genes, or B, is there something the drug is doing to the PPAR gamma itself that has additional levels mm -hmm. beyond just the phosphorylation? Mm -hmm. Uh, the answer is that for many of the genes, the effect you get with suppressing the phosphorylation is not as strong as the effect of the drug. So certainly the drug may be doing uh, other things. But I have to tell you that from a mathematical perspective, that's not a statistically significant effect. So we actually, one of the reviewers of our paper pushed us a little bit about this, and we did the mathematics. So. It, it actually is not significant. I know the colors stand out a lot better. Though the group thing that really is different is with rosy glitazone, that adipogenesis agonist set. Well, for sure, that's, that's through the roof. But the CDK5 gene set versus the mutation in the, versus the drugs, that is actually not significantly different. Although it is possible that it's also doing other things in addition to, to blocking this phosphorylation. Good. Um, I just want to thank Bruce. Oops. Just want to thank Bruce again for a very enlightening talk. You've you know really given them, given us a whole lot to 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 uh, think about. And I'd like to uh, invite the uh, audience to join us next door at the auditorium, where we'll be serving some refreshments, and you'll have an opportunity to continue your discussion with Bruce. So, Bruce, thanks again for a great talk. Thank you.